the thing that struck me, at least this time around, was how incredibly compassionate chapter 14 of Luke really is. Jesus begins with God willing to heal, uh, even on the Sabbath. And then he moves on to the seat of honor at God's banquet, which reveals God's heart. He wants to lift up to exalt the humble. And it ends with this instruction that's, that's really quite intriguing. Luke 14, 13, but when you host an elaborate meal, when Canaan has a fellowship dinner, it's in there in, in, in italics, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of righteousness. Rather interesting, isn't it, is that righteousness is defined here not by what you know or how you discern things or any of that. It's defined by the fact that you help people who cannot repay you. And then it goes on in the chapter, the parable of the great banquet, which is a metaphor on how God invites. God invites us to the banquet based on need, not worthiness. That's huge. That's huge. The chapter gateways into the parables of seeking the one lost sheep and rejoicing at the one lost coin. Teaching after teaching on the level that God loves you and me right down to the personal level. And keep in mind, keep in mind the world as it was when Jesus is presenting God in this way. The man-made religions, you offered sacrifices to the gods, why? Was not because they loved you, but because if you gave them something, they might not beat you up in life. That's really what it was all about. They might not kill you, they might not, um, uh, torture you or torment you. It was all about appeasement. Even Judaism, the main uh, stream of Judaism saw God as an iron-fisted ruler and the law served as a very thin velvet glove over that fist. Then along comes Jesus. Along comes Jesus, the Jesus of uh, chapter 14 here. And the picture, I don't think we fully appreciate how revolutionary what you're telling me that there is a one true God, there's something in itself, and this one true God actually loves people? And wait, let me get this straight, that God loves people so much that he came down here? Now for the Greeks, this is mind blowing. You don't mix the divine and the physical. God loves so much that he came down and walked among us. Nobody preached to God like that. That was unheard of. Unheard of. So you have all this beauty of a loving God. We'll start there. All this beauty of a loving God, then sandwiched right in the middle of all this love and beauty is this cautionary tale. Like we said last week, it's like book ends to the gospel. Complementary mirror, one's white, one's black, as far as the outlook in them. They both come to the same conclusion here. You want this? It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. It's count the cost. And in these bookends, uh, there's, uh, what goes on is there's a cost that is illustrated in the metaphors, and then there is reward that's implied. Cost illustrated, reward that's implied. What it means is this, cost to walk with Jesus. Salvation may be free, but it costs you to walk with Jesus. But here's the other side of it. It's really, really worth it. In fact, it's more than worth it. It will cost you, but it's worth it. Expect it. Expect it. Expect the cost. Expect the reward. Expect it. There is a God who loves you all over this chapter. A God who is perfect and he's looking out. He is orchestrating your eternal good if you're willing to pay the price. 
if you're willing to follow. So understanding what Jesus is saying starts with this. Understanding at least to some degree the, the times in which he's speaking. And a, a Pastor Chris pointed this out when he started in the Sermon of the Mount, who he was talking to. We're talking about, for the most part, everyday people out there. He's teaching them from their own world, from their own life. So if we can understand their point of view, we'll gain uh, insight that we may not otherwise have. So what was in mind for them when they hear these illustrations? Well, we're going to start with the white bookend, if you will, the white one here. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Luke 14, 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. The first thing that kind of got me with this as I was looking over it was, why towers? We're talking common people. Common people like us, we don't build towers. I don't know anyone here built the, uh, a, a cell tower out here at Heritage Lake. Sometimes I think we wish we had another one so the reception would be better. But just the average Joe doesn't go out and build towers, even more so in their time. You don't have the resources. You don't have the money. You don't have the human ability to go out and build this by yourself. Now, if he was talking houses, it would make sense. And of course, he does in other parables. We don't talk about towers too much because the price is so high. So when he was, why? Why did he use towers? What would have came to the mind of an ancient listener when he heard this thing about towers? Well, we're not talking cell towers because it's at least another 100 years before the... <laughs> <laughs> before there's cell towers. Now we're talking the towers. So what are the towers of ancient times? What would come to mind? Well, a few things even to this day, uh, all towers have in common. You have uh, the fact that towers are public. Towers are public. If you were going to build a tower in a city, there's no such thing as a secret tower in a city because it towers over everything else. So it's going to be very public especially when they're building out of stone and everything the way they were in that day, the foundation is going to be elaborate. It's going to be a, a very serious thing. Now, when we talked about foundation in other parables with houses, and the picture was if you had no foundation or a bad foundation, that house would eventually fall. Well, if you don't have a, an elaborate foundation for a tower, it's never going to get up in the first place. It's going to be falling before you ever get it up. So there's an implied lesson for us here. God is the architect of the salvation plan. God has a plan to save humanity. It's his plan. He's carrying it out. We follow in his footsteps or we're not there at all. He is the architect of the salvation plan. But in reality, you and me, we are the architects of our faith. We are the architects of our foundation. It's on us, how so? Well, our diligence is going to determine if we end up with a foundation that's balanced or off kilter. I'll give you a prime example. Chris, Pastor Chris came up, he talked about a discipleship prayer circle thing going on on Fridays that's coming up. We're there or we're not there. Uh, we'll, uh, in our doing, we'll either have a foundation that's level or it's slanted, that it's complete or it's got all kinds of major gaps in it. Uh, it'll be where we spend a lot of time absorbing biblical truth, not just reading your Bible that's not how it's done. It's absorbing and owning the truth that's in there. How deeply we do that, that's on us. That's on you and me. Uh, how much we allow ourselves to be discipled or how much we stubbornly refuse to be discipled, 
That's not on God. He's provided the material. He's provided the opportunity. That's on us. We are the architects of that foundation of our own faith. The implication in the parable is this builder gets off to a good start. He is building that good foundation that we're talking about. He puts in the effort. And people notice. People notice that. Do you know anyone in that, that man, they were kind of not a very nice person or not a very spiritual person, not a very godly person, and all of a sudden something changes in them? And you go, wow, there's something happening. People notice when you're building a foundation. But the implication in this parable, this building of the towers, we don't know why. Maybe the guy runs out of money. Maybe he runs out of resources. He, he becomes distracted. He becomes misguided. Or he's just plain lazy. Who knows? But he abandons the project. And there it is. Everyone can see the foundation that got started. Maybe the first bricks of the tower are starting up and it's not finished. Ever know anyone you'd say, you know, that's kind of how I saw their spiritual life go. They seem to be off to such a good start. And now they're gone. It's a tragic thing, isn't it? It's a tragic thing. Jesus is using the tower to illustrate this danger. So what can we find out? What can we glean from ancient towers? <laughs> what is it about them that we want? What is it about them that they were something people desired to build in the first place? Well, you can actually take a bunch of broad categories and we could say if you were in ancient times and you're thinking of towers, this is the type of thing uh, would come to mind. Well, let me start with you. If I say towers and I say in the Bible, what's the first tower that comes to mind to you in the Bible? Wow. Boom! <laughs> there was just a whole bunch of bees came out there. The Tower of Babel, that's where we start. And the Tower of Babel is so interesting and fits so well that it'll fit a number of the categories that we talked about. And we'll start with this one, is status towers. Status towers. When you build a tower, it was often like the Tower of Babel. It was a monument to human pride. Why build a tower to heaven? Because we can. That's what it's all about. It's, it's this monument to our genius of what we're capable of doing. There were other status towers. Kings built towers. They had them on their palaces and, and our walls of their cities, all that type of thing. And the thing is, people would live in these type of towers, the, and it literally was a, a status tower. You literally lived above the common people. You were up there, they were down there. So you had these status towers. As a matter of fact, uh, the term ivory tower, ever hear that? People living in their ivory tower? Well, that's an interesting phrase. It wasn't coined until 1830, dealing with uh, uh, a thing with the upper academia. But the idea of an ivory tower goes back to when we first invented a pecking order, is who is uh, up in that tower? Who is the one above the rest of us? So towers, in some cases, are just noble things. In some cases, they're visions of the grand or the grandiose. And to be a child of God is interesting because it's actually a mix of humility and majesty. Humility and living in a tower, in a way. Humility, of course, to be like Christ. Majesty being above uh, in this way, not who you are, but who loves you. Who is working on you. Communication towers. We were talking about cell towers, but you know, uh, the first communication towers go back all the way to 400 BC. And the Greeks invented these. They had them, a network along the uh, Aegean Sea. And the towers were in line of sight. So if you had invaders coming, they would light what they called the frictorii, these bonfires up on these towers, and you would see them down, you know, all the way down until they knew all the way to Athens that there was an invader coming. The towers go. So it's a pretty amazing thing. 
to think that we had a communication system that worked at the speed of light in 400 BC. Gave one message, but it was pretty interesting. Communication. Man, if we just communicated. I can't remember the French philosopher who said that it is impossible to, love, to uh, hate someone you understand. And it's true, communication allows us to understand. When we understand, we can coordinate. And when we can coordinate, that cultivates unity. And one of the benchmarks of the biblical church is unity. If there's no unity, it's not really a biblical church. So towers have the ability to join us together, which fits in kind of with the next one. There's utility towers. A prime example of that would be the Tower of the Flock. If you ever get a chance to go over to Israel, you may see the remains of this, of this one, Migdal Eddar, Mid, Migdal Eddar. And I can't say that fast three times. But all the same, this tower, it uh, was actually a, a, a sanctified building of David's way back in the day. But it was turned into a watchtower for the temple pastures uh, around Bethlehem. And, and the idea, <coughs> Kathy was proactive today. She gave me water before I ever get up here. So it's just painful to watch a choking pastor, I understand. But they turned it into a shepherd tower. And how it worked is Bethlehem, these large tracts of land with all the temple sheep, the ones that would be used in sacrifice and such, they would watch over them and they would have the shepherds on the ground, but then they would have that fellow who was designated to be up in the tower who could see the whole area. And you can see how that would work. He'd be the first to see uh, predators coming or to see that sheep that was straying off, and then he could let people know on the ground. So let's try this. Let's say we're the shepherds in Jerusalem, the, the priest shepherds, and we allocate someone. He's the observer guy in the tower. What would your qualifications be if you say, who should be up in that tower? What would you be looking for? Not blind. <laughs> not blind. A blind observer is not very good. As a matter of fact, I'll one up on that, Pastor Chris. I would say, not only that, I would look and say, who in here has the best eyesight? And when you think of that, you're gifted. That's not something you work out. You're gifted with that. So the fellow with this gift of exceptional eyesight would be the one who should be in the tower. Now, it sounds like, you know, that's that's quite an honor in a way, but it's also an incredible position of accountability. Because if the wolves come out and get some of those sheep, who's the first guy who's going to get blamed? The guy in the tower. It's a perfect metaphor of how the whole Bible, or at least the New Testament church, involves biblically. Uh, we have leading elders and uh, they're referred to as shepherds and overseers. And that's understood from this. Even the word pastor comes from that. And like those Bethlehem shepherds, these individuals are called and uh, gifted by God, or they should be, that they're up there watching in the tower. They're supposed to be the people with the eyesight and the insight, and they are accountable one of the worst things that can ever happen is having somebody up in the tower who is blind. You want someone up there who sees. But the guys who are working their own jobs, because all these shepherds are necessary, working their own jobs in the pasture, they have their accountability, but also accountability to say, hey, if the guy in the tower sees something, I better pay attention to what he sees up there. It's a beautiful metaphor what's going on. So we have the utility towers. And of course, we have military towers, both defensive and offensive military towers. Defensive towers. Let me throw that up. Where would defensive towers be in the 
the ancient world. City walls. city walls, right? City walls, exactly right. All the cities were walled at the time. And the idea of having these towers around, once again, you didn't want a blind guy up there. But you would have these people up, and their job was to sound the alarm. Who would see the enemy coming before anyone else? The guy in the tower. And that might make the difference between the city being prepared and falling to some terrible enemy. Being a watchman in the city towers was a crucial position. Whoever we look at in there, they were to see what others were yet to see. In the Old Testament, the prophets fit in this. As a matter of fact, Habakkuk 2.1 says this. Habakkuk's an interesting book. It said that of all the prophets, this is the only guy who actually questioned God as far as he was willing to argue with God, and God would argue back. In fact, um, God saw honor in, in the way he did this. But anyway, verse 1 from uh, chapter 2. I will stand at my watch post... I will remain stationed on the city wall. I will keep watching so I can see what he says to me. Really interesting. Not so much in this case looking for the enemy, but looking for the answer that's going to come back from God to his question. When he counters my argument, he expects it. And can know I should answer when he counters my argument. The answer from God does come to Habakkuk in a vision, reveals the coming invasion and the ultimate fall of Babylon. And he speaks of the power of the divine warrior, who the prophet calls, quote, the joy of my salvation. Hmm, I wonder who he was thinking of there. So you have these defensive towers looking out for the enemy. Then you have offensive towers towers. Romans were big on this one. You have siege towers. And what's the purpose of a siege tower? It puts you eye to eye with those guys on the wall. And it's this potent tool where you can tear down the enemy's stronghold. Everybody knew this. There were defensive towers that dealt with one form of enemy. And there were offensive towers that dealt with another kind of enemy. The defensive dealt with the enemy without. Who is the enemy without? I'll stop for a drink. Who is the enemy outside of us? What did you say, Paula Pam? Anybody who's not us, welcome to the world. There we go. Pastor Chris was just talking about that in Sunday school. The enemy without is we do not battle against principalities on earth, but those in spiritual places. Dark things, dark rulers in dark places and dominion. Our outside foe is Satan. Our outside foe is the dark realm. Let's try this one then. Who's the enemy within? Uh, I heard us and I like that. What did you say, Steve? Flesh. Our flesh, yeah. Bottom line is in both answers, the flesh refers to the old self as far as a believer is concerned. The old self, the you who is in the old nature. We have an enemy without and sometimes we blame the enemy without when we're actually dealing with the enemy within. But the idea of the right tower is it's looking out for the enemy without, but it's keeping an eye of the enemy within. Paul was aware of this, 2 Corinthians 10.4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's not someone else's, that's my own strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
towers are for that. We have religious towers. Once again, Tower of Babel would fit in there because a lot of times there were other towers in the place that were bridges between heaven and earth. That's why they were built like that. They were a bridge between heaven and earth. In some cases, the place itself was that bridge. And in other cases, the tower would be the residence of the priests or the oracles of that faith. They were the bridge, but they resided in the tower. Remember in the Old Testament, it talked about the pagan high places? For a large point, this is what we're talking about. Places that were designed high or set on high places that were a bridge between heaven and earth. Uh, in that case, just the wrong type of bridge. Even the temple in Jerusalem is built on a mount. So the idea of this bridge between heaven and earth, religious towers, as Jesus spoke, as he was talking to people just like us sitting here, all of these things would come to mind to people. The intentions of building a tower for noble purpose, for a majestic purpose, for a utilitarian purpose, and the accountability that went that a tower to diligently defend, or a tower to tear down strongholds, all of these things all fit the symbolism of spiritual formation in warfare. And all, spiritual or literal, because when we're talking of a tower in the metaphor, we're talking about building your spiritual formation. They carry a steep price. That's what Jesus is saying. Salvation is free, come on to me. But if you want to grow in your faith and become what you're supposed to, it will cost you. It will cost you. It's a wonderful thing you want to grasp. You want to build that tower, but it will cost you. And if you start and then you abandon it, you're going to look really silly. You're going to be very vulnerable the job needs to be completed. The white bookend, if you will, is you want this at any cost. Then we move on to the dark bookend. The, uh, the towers symbolize that, what is desired that's worth any cost. But the warring king symbolize what you want to avoid at any cost. And so we're on to that end. Luke 14.31. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who is coming against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, don't waste time, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Now, we've got to go back into the ancient mindset. What was the specter of war? What did it mean in the ancient world? Well, even by Rome, Rome was really progressive in the day because Rome waged war for domination. The empires that were before them waged war for obliteration. If we look at the empires like the Assyrians, legendary, brutal, or the Babylonians, they didn't conquer another culture to enforce dominance. What they did was exterminate. They reduced it to nothing. When northern Israel fell to the Assyrians, there were no people left. That's a whole other story, and we could get into Samaria on that one. But all the people who were legitimate Hebrew people at the time were killed in horrific ways. The few that remained were dispersed into other cultures. Why? So that no trace of their culture would remain. A king's wrath in that time would mean everything you knew would disappear. If you went to war with a superior king, everything you knew would disappear. Pretty ugly stuff. Let's go back to a thought we had earlier in this. You are the lesser king. I am the lesser king or queen. You are king or queen of your life. God has allowed it. He's given you sovereignty over your choices. You don't have to be in here this morning. 
You don't have to be listening online. God's not going to make you do that. It's your choice to do it or not to do it. And so we live in this illusion. We're under control. Everybody wants to be under control. We understand that. But what happens when forces greater than ourselves come? Can you control whether you get cancer or not? Well, maybe to a little tiny degree. Can you control when there's some terrible catastrophe that happens through nature some other way? No. Can you control the will of God? If God determines something, can you control that? Sometimes we try. So a quick opinion poll. If in this part of the parable, if we're the lesser king, who's the greater king? Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Bing, bing. I just had to have some. We had to catch Jennifer between drinks, between sips. Okay. Oh, you're definitely awake. And then Paul is throwing, but she's a long way off. We need to build those towers with the light signals, Paul. I can hear you way over there. But you're both absolutely right. That is what we're talking about. God is the greater king. He's the one you don't want to go to war with. He's the one you don't... Because God, in his wrath, and God has wrath. It's not just the Old Testament. Here it is, Jesus himself speaking of the wrath of God. But it isn't cruel. It is existential. It will change everything. When the absolute creator demolishes, guess what? He demolishes absolutely. If he decides to destroy, there's nothing left. Revelation 21.8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, and the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the what? The second death. The second death. Interesting. Something kind of beyond our imaginations, but the second death is this unimaginable state in which it appears we're in conscious existence, but completely devoid of any form of what we'd call life. Existing, but without life. From the biblical standpoint, conscious torment, and not by demons. So you kind of get a kick. It's the old devil with the pitchfork thing. No, because all that darkness that ends up in the second death is suffering the same type of existence. So what is the torture of hell then? You know, the analogy, the only thing as I look at the whole thing that kind of came to me a little bit is an amputee with phantom pain is there's that arm or leg that's gone and still somehow you feel excruciating pain with something that's no longer there because in effect, everyone who is in the second death has been amputated. Life has been amputated. Somehow existence is there, but life has been amputated. <clears throat> I think that's a pale analogy to what really goes on. But those are the bookends. There's, you want to build the tower at any cost, you will want to avoid the war at any cost. There's a, a great passage Jesus says, where he kind of combines both things. In uh, Matthew 10, 27, uh, it starts with, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Well, there's the tower. Do not be afraid of those who will kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Wow, there's an interesting word. Actually, we come with two Greek words uh, in the New Testament that tend to get interchanged used with the word hell. We have the word sheol. That's kind of borrowed from the Old, the old Testament concept. 
the grave, the place of the underworld, it's uh, the realm of the dead, but it's the second word that's the real kicker. And it goes back into ancient history in Israel too. See, outside the city walls of Jerusalem, um, at one time where they're at the lowest point of the, their corruption, if you will, they built a large bronze statue of a god bull. <coughs> and it stood there uh, above the valley with its arms outstretched like this. And it was hollow inside and in the bottom they would light fires until the whole bronze bull was just searing hot. And in the height of this corruption, they would take their children, the firstborn, and they would place that child on those searing arms. And as a child would be screaming, they would sing very, very loudly whatever the pagan uh, chants were at the time so they couldn't hear the cries. And then the child would roll off those arms and fall into the fires below. Later, when Israel reformed from this, it, they saw it now as such a reprehensible practice that they refused to do anything with this land except burn the city refuse there. It was a vile and a putrid place. And the Greek name for it is Gehenna, but the actual name from the ancient Hebrew is Gai Ben Hinnom. Gai Ben Hinnom, which means the valley of the son of Hinnom. And that name became synonymous with misery and damnation. Terrible history to that word. There's where Jesus is coming from. Jesus points out that there are those who will rush headlong into war with God. Once again, Sunday school, that was great. You guys were playing and touching into this effect that we live in a world that is very, very quick to rush headlong into war with God. And it's a tragically foolish war because it is a war that God never wanted and we can never win. It has a horrible, horrible outcome. In the ancient world, if the lesser king did submit, he didn't go to war, but he did send a delegation. He did uh, negotiate with the greater king. Chances are that kingdom, the lesser kingdom, would become a vassal state. And a vassal state then would pay tribute to the greater king. But it was even more than that, because see, if you were this weaker kingdom, and you came under the umbrella of that great kingdom, you were now under the protection of that great kingdom. Being a vassal state was not all bad. The worst thing to do was to go to war. To go to war with something so much more powerful than you are. Now, that's just culture to culture. What we're talking about, the stakes are way higher because we're not talking about just a culture. We're not even talking about your entire life, which is a vapor, uh, just you know, a blade of grass here and then gone. We're talking about your eternal life. We're talking about eternal life. Pursue peace at any cost. Pursue peace at any cost. Avoid the wrath at any cost. There are the bookends. There is a tower of spiritual formation for you and me, it is worth having at any cost. White bookend to the gospel. There is a wrath, there is a war that you cannot win, and it gets really, really ugly. You want to avoid that war with that more powerful king at any cost. Count the cost. Whether it be avoiding, or whether it be attaining, count the cost. There is a cost, white or black. There is a cost, expect it. There is a reward, expect it. There is a damnation, expect it. Now, here's the thing about paying the cost. You don't pay the cost to grow. Actually, you grow by paying 
the cost. Sometimes it's referred to as you being the gold, being refined in the fire. That's what's going on in this paying of the cost. It cost to be refined. Expect it. Let me leave you with a challenge this morning. This is one of those internal looking things. As you navigate your life, I have no idea when you leave here where you're going, what you're doing, how you will think, how you will feel, where your mind will be. But as you leave here and you continue on with your life, does your heart, does your mindset, do your choices look like you're expecting this? Do you live like you expect what Jesus is telling us we better expect? The cost to grow because it's really, really worth it. The cost to avoid what can be avoided because it's really, really worth it. Count the cost.